بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين uh, Welcome everyone to uh, this um, interactive webinar uh, titled The Blind Path to Methanol Toxicity uh, uh, So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce your moderator for the day uh, Dr. Uh, Badr al Yahya. Dr. Badr is a consultant uh, emergency medicine from King Saud University Medical City. Dr. Badr, tafadhal. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to uh, this webinar about methanol uh, toxicity. Uh, you probably have heard uh, that we are, uh, we have seen a number of cases of methanol poisoning in Riyadh over the last uh, week or so. And that's the reason why we, we had to arrange for this webinar urgently in order to orient people uh, and increase awareness of what's going on. Uh, I'm not gonna be talking a lot here. I'll just uh, uh, move the microphone to the first speaker, Dr. Asad Sufiani. He's a medical toxicologist and an emergency physician at King Abdullah uh, uh, Medical City in Mecca. Uh, welcome Dr. Asad. Um, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, clear. Okay, yes, good. We do. Um, so, uh, so uh, let's uh, go quickly to the first slide. Okay, so um, can you see the slide? Yes. Ex okay, so thank you everybody for joining us tonight. My name is uh, Asada Sufiani. Uh, um, uh, I'm an emergency physician at King Abdullah Medical City. Did my uh, uh, emergency training uh, in the US and uh, um, American Board uh, uh, Emergency uh, uh, Medicine Certified. I did my uh, fellowship in medical toxicology and I'm currently, uh, as I said, working at King Abdullah Medical City in Mecca. Um, so, we'll, uh, so as I'm the first one to talk um, uh, tonight, uh, we'll start to talk about uh, the history of methanol toxicity. Um, is it just a, a, a something that happens in our uh, country or our region, or is it something global? Um, so, so what is meth uh, methanol? So the first people who used methanol actually was uh, were the ancient Egyptians, uh, and it used it for um, uh, embalming. Um, as the embalming fluid for their um, corpse. Uh, the first time um, methanol was isolated was uh, in the early uh, 1600 um, and was called um, the spirit of box, okay, uh, coming from the boxwood tree, which is, a, you see a picture of it um, at the right side. Um, methanol, uh, or it, um, as you know, any alcohol, you add the, suff uh, the suffix ol to it. So it's com it comes from the, uh, the name methyl alcohol. Methyl comes from the Greek word uh, metu, which is wine, and ool is the wood. So uh, hence the name wood alcohol or wood wine, which as we know, the, uh, the name of the, um, of the methanol. So uh, methanol poisoning. Um, usually, um, most of the times, uh, or uh, we should say, not, we, I shouldn't say most of the time, um, sometimes it can be um, as just a small um, single incident uh, where you have like um, uh, people just like um, uh, accidentally um, ingesting or um, exposed to um, uh, methanol, either dermal or other inhalation, maybe, uh, or it can be an epidemic outbreak, um, uh, and it it it, uh, it occurs um, on a day on a on a global basis, um, and it's um, and as we will see, it's uh, it's something that's been uh, going on for a long time. Um, the problem with uh, global um, uh, poisoning uh, or global uh, outbreaks of methanol poisoning is that diagnosis and treatment um, is not uh, something that uh, every physician is uh, is like accustomed to or like um, aware of uh, and many cases just go un unnoticed and undetected um, and uh, some of the, the the patients will shy to go to the uh, emergency department um, because um, uh, alcohol drinking or like a drinking in general is just like something is prohibited and just like be shameful for them to go to the hospital. 
Um, so uh, um, you can see on the right, there's um, a list of the, um, uh, just move this. There's a list of um, um, incident that were like uh, published in newspaper uh, over the last like 20 years or so. Uh, most of the time when we talk about uh, outbreak, it's, it comes from consumption of illicit handmade or locally made alcoholic uh, beverages. Um, and um, sometimes uh, those who do it, they intentionally put methanol um, uh, and mix it with ethanol or water uh, just for uh, like uh, to increase their profit margin. So the first, no, uh, first, uh, or the first like um, uh, known outbreak um, in the history was in Spain, not, not here in, the, in, the, in this region. Um, and there was like a, this uh, uh, merchant or like uh, winery called uh, Rogelio Aviar, uh, which just like uh, took some um, or like a lot of like uh, methanol uh, and just mixed it with local uh, with with just like alcohol. Um, to to make a lot of like um, bottles and just like increase their profit margin, um, and as a result, the official numbers were like fifty one dead and nine blind. Um, but till uh, um, till today, um, some like um, uh, locals in Spain talks about like a thousand to five thousand um, uh, dead because of consum uh, consuming these. Um, 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 drinks, um, and they are going after um, uh, this uh, winery, although it's just like it, it went bankruptcy because of it. Um, in Ontario in 1999, um, uh, the, the, the poison center just like uh, collected all the fatalities from uh, methanol poisoning and found that more than half of it are actually due to accidental ingestion. Um, from illicit resources. In Estonia in uh, 2001, they did a study uh, because they had like 111 cases of methanol poisoning. So they, they followed them up for like six years for outcome. Um, and they found that most of those patients, like 20, uh, 25 uh, patients died uh, immediately as a, uh, as a cause of, uh, um, because of the uh, alcohol, ethanol uh, or methanol um, toxicity. And um, many of the survivor got neurological um, abnormality because of free exposure to methanol. Um, Libya and Kenya, again, the same thing. In Libya, uh, more than a thousand patients uh, were poisoned with methanol after drinking bucha or bucha, uh, which is a local like uh, drink uh, made there. Uh, with fatality rate uh, above, uh, around like 10%. Uh, in Kenya, the same thing. Um, uh, to outbreak, um, they added methanol to spike the drink uh, and give it an extra kick. And as a result, uh, out of like a total of like 500 uh, uh, patients, uh, there were like uh, 130 or 150 uh, who died. In Uganda in 2017, an, uh, like a small outbreak happened in one of the city where like 15 patients arrived to the emergency department, 12 of them died. Um, and you see the median age here is like in the 40s with like range from 20 to 60s. Um, and these like um, uh, is what we usually see. Um, uh, Middle-aged men uh, uh, with median age in the 30s and 40s. Um, and um, they, they have this, uh, uh, they drink what they think is ethanol and it's methanol and they uh, present to the emergency um, uh, later. Um, in this case, the outbreak was caused by uh, um, uh, adulterated alcohol with methanol. Um, and again, it's the seller who uh, used to sell uh, drinks mixed methanol with, alcohol, with uh, ethanol uh, just to increase their profit. In Egypt in 2000, uh, just in uh, this year, uh, six Ukrainians uh, admitted to the hospital uh, in Cairo um, because they made their own uh, alcoholic beverage using 70% um, ethanol disinfectant from a local pharmacy. Turns out it's 70% methanol. 
uh, one patient died and uh, two were comatose and uh, uh, three, I mean, the rest of the, like the five uh, patients uh, had to be admitted to the ICU for a long time. Um, other places, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, the same thing, we see the same issue. Uh, adulterated alcoholic beverages, people will drink it thinking it's uh, ethanol and it turns out it's mixed with methanol. Uh, Iran, during the pandemic, uh, I think they had the, the highest uh, rate um, of cases uh, or the number of cases. They had like more than 5,000 cases from February to early May this year uh, with more than 500 uh, deaths from um, methanol uh, toxicity. Um, and that's it. So uh, uh, what, what I want you to um, uh, get out of this um, uh, presentation um, is that it's a global issue. Um, it's not um, in our country or in our region, it's everywhere. Um, and again, it's, uh, it's due to mixing uh, alcohol or uh, ethanol or alcoholic beverages with methanol um, either accidentally, if it's like locally made or handmade, or intentionally for profit margin, if it's done by somebody who's just like spreading it um, or selling it to others. Dr. Badr. Thank you, Dr. Asad. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Nahar Arweli. He is uh, uh, an, a pediatric emergency uh, physician and a medical toxicologist as, at King Faisal Hospital in Riyadh. And uh, he's going to talk to us about the uh, diagnosis and uh, the, the presentation and diagnosis of methanol intoxication. Welcome, Dr. Nahar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you, everyone, for uh, attending with us this important topic. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Asad, for this nice introduction. Um, I want to talk about the uh, uh, presentation and diagnosis of methanol toxicity. I agree that it is, it is really, really challenging. Why? Uh, number one, it's unexpected. There is no warning. It's not like a disease that you see in the winter or infection that you come into a country and then you expect to arrive to your country. It's by sudden you have rush of cases in your area with methanol toxicity and you may be not ready for this, these cases. The other thing, the issue of late presentation uh, uh, for different reasons, maybe uh, the patient doesn't realize that he or she ingested methanol or uh, with co-ingestion of ethanol, this will delay the presentation. And I am coming to that. Uh, one of challenges, uh, lack of diagnosis, diagnostic and therapeutic tools. Diagnostic tools, for example, uh, methanol level or formic acid level. It's, we know it's not available in most of the hospitals. And therapeutic interventions like hemodialysis or the antidote, again, it's not always available. Uh, uh, there is sometimes there is no clear guidelines uh, and uh, uh, really we should work on this in, in our uh, country and region to make sure that we have guidelines that guide people. Uh, uh, they are, uh, most of the people, they are not medical toxicologists, so they need to have something in their hand to guide their care of the patient. Other thing, limited research, most of the cases that I, I, I find or you find is a small number, about 50 to 100, not like other diseases like methyl and, uh, asthma or paracetamol overdose, you find big, large studies here. No, it's usually limited. Understanding the methanol metabolism, very important. Uh, as you see in this picture or this slide, methanol metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase to formaldehyde. And formaldehyde metabolized by uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase to formic acid. You see the red color, formic acid, 
is the toxic metabolite of methanol that cause blindness and metabolic acidosis. So if there is no formic acid, there will be no uh, 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 significant toxicity. And as you see in the, in the area of uh, metabolism of methanol to formaldehyde, there is alcohol dehydrogenase, which metabolizes also ethanol. So if someone taking ethanol with methanol at the same time, which is, happens in, in most of the cases, the ethanol will compete with methanol and, uh, and alde al alcohol dehydrogenase. So alcohol dehydrogenase will get busy with ethanol and be uh, slowing the metabolism of methanol. This is, will decrease the, the severity of the toxicity, but most of the time it will happen and it will delay the presentation. And instead of six hours, it will take, for example, 24 hours. Even for treatment of methanol, uh, as uh, uh, my colleague will talk about it after this, most of the time we are playing in this area to get the ADH busy. Presentation also, it's challenging. As you see, early in the course of methanol toxicity, usually you will deal with uh, a drunk person uh, uh, with uh, drowsiness. Uh, the only unusual things you may find that there is, for example, metabolic acidosis or there is CNS finding. Otherwise, it's difficult to differentiate between ethanol or methanol toxicity. But with time, after uh, six to three hours, you will see more symptoms and signs of methanol, like me metabolic acidosis, usually it's high anion gap metabolic acidosis, compensatory hyperventilation. Uh, the patient may have seizure, coma, death, GI symptoms, pancreatitis, myocarditis, myositis, ARDS, and multi-organ failure, including kidney injury. So as you see, all of this presentation is not specific. It's it happened with many things, not specific. So we need either history suggestive of the exposure or some test helping me to establish the diagnosis in addition to the presentation. For the eye toxicity, it's significant. When we say methanol, first thing come to my mind, blindness. And uh, the usual visual symptoms, it's ranging from just mild or blurry vision to complete blindness. Uh, so the patient may have central uh, scototoma, impaired papillary response to light, decreased visual acuity, photophobia, visual defect, and this is the picture, the snow field vision. This is what we call snow field, someone seeing everything. The or a reverse. So um, this is one of the studies that I think one of the best studies that evaluate this point about the visual uh, effect secondary to methanol. Uh, uh, guys, can I test my voice? Are you still hearing me? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Nahar. Montez. So uh, about the visual disturbance, this is study done in about 50, uh, 50 person exposed or ingested methanol. And they divided the patient to two groups. One of them, they have only blurred vision or snow field visual effect. So it's, it's mild to moderate. And the other group, they have severe deep blindness. For the first group that they have only snow field or blurred vision, most of the time, or all of them, they have 
only transient visual disturbance. All of them, they come back to normal. For the people with uh, severe blindness, all of them, they have permanent visual disturbance. Some of them, they have partial improvement. Yes, but it became permanent. Some of them, they have same uh, uh, blindness at the time of the presentation. Some of them, they recover, but later on, they have worsening of their eye manifestation. In this study, they found no significant difference at the time of the presentation, regardless of the age or the time or presence of GI symptoms or uh, a neurological manifestation or blood gases. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, it is not affecting the presentation. Brain methanol toxicity, uh, it may cause seizure, coma, uh, and usually a presentation after six to 24 hours. If there is ethanol ingestion, this presentation may be presented later than uh, uh, 12 to 24 hours. And one of the rare complication, vitamin, butaminal, uh, butaminal necrosis, uh, uh, which represent the presentation, rigidity, tremor, masked faces, and abnormal speech or monotonous speech. As you see the picture uh, on the right, this is from autopsy of uh, someone died with, with methanol overdose with uh, butamin necrosis. Another finding, CNS finding, by uh, a radiological test. As you see the first one, uh, this is MRI with bilateral necrosis of a butamine. Uh, uh, the, the, one is, the one on the right, this one also bilateral lentiform nucleus necrosis. It's a close to the butamine. And the one here, in addition to the necrosis, there is also bleeding to, to butamine and globus pallidus. And in this one, there is extensive uh, uh, basal ganglia necrosis. So I don't think it's our role to give the diagnosis or to read the CT, but we know that there, the, it results in significant brain insult and mainly it's affect the butamine, mainly necrosis and the bleeding. Diagnosis is another challenge. We will have in our hand clinical presentation plasma methanol, plasma formate, osmolar gap, and anion gap metabolic acidosis. Uh, no one uh, except, except plasma methanol and the plasma formate, they are specific, yes. If we have plasma methanol or formate, that's it. This is the diagnosis. But as I said, it's not available. So I cannot depend on these tests. And uh, if, 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 uh, if it's late and all of the methanol metabolized, also the formate is excreted, it may come negative if it's, for example, four days or five days. Clinical diagnosis, it's, it's not specific as we, we discuss it. Osmolar gap is good. It might help me, but it's not specific, not, not, not sensitive. So remember that, osmolar gap, may help me, but not specific, not sensitive. And the other issue that on the beginning of, uh, uh, sorry, on the late time of the, the presentation, the patient may have normal osmolar gap. So later on, for example, after 24 hours, 20 hours, the osmolar gap, you will find it normal. It might be high in the beginning. Uh, anion gap metabolic acidosis, it might help. But keep in mind, in the, in the beginning of, uh, of the toxicity, it might be normal. So you may have a patient with no, no metabolic acidosis and has significant methanol toxicity, but with time, the patient will show metabolic acidosis. So this is the time uh, in toxicology that we need the osmolar gap. I and mean, most of the time, everyone ordering serum osmolality, calculated osmolality, uh, osmolar gap, but it's very important to understand when do we need it and how we can read. The best indication for toxic alcohol. 
whether methanol or ethylene glycol. And the osmolar gap or a small gap is the difference between major osmolality and calculated osmolality. What the meaning of major osmolality? Meaning I take the blood sample and I will send it to the lab to give me a number without any calculation. And they should, in the lab for toxic alcohol, they should use freezing point depression method. There are two methods for in the lab, but we are using freezing point depression method. If we are using the boiling method or papering method, it will give uh, false normal osmolality. So remember that freezing point uh, uh, depression method. For calculated osmolality, it's calculation. It's uh, sodium to sodium plus EUN plus glucose. Everyone divided by a certain number plus ethanol. So if we look to the component, we have sodium, BUN, glucose, and if the patient drank, I will add the ethanol. So if we have osmolar gap more than 10, it's significant. What does it mean? Meaning that there is something in the blood increase the, the osmolality. It's not the sodium, not the BUN, not the glucose, not the ethanol, and most likely it is toxic alcohol. But again, it's not specific, not sensitive. Uh, some of the patients, they have normal osmolar gap, but their level, the methanol level is significant and the patient needs dialysis. The normal osmolar gap from minus 14 to plus minus 10. So if someone, his baseline minus 10 and uh, reporting now five, there is 15 and all of this normal, there is 15 difference, which is uh, 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 if we correlate it with methanol level, the methanol, the methanol level may be high, more than 30 and require dialysis. When do I, I say as Muller Gab is Dr. Nahar, your, uh, your voice is, uh, raise your voice, please. We're losing it. Thank you. How about, how about now? Now it's great, thank you. Yeah, so if the osmolar gap more than 50, it's most likely suggestive of toxic alcohol. Um, finally, the metabolic acidosis. If we have metabolic acidosis with high anion gap, I am sure most of you uh, know how to calculate the anion gap. And if it's more than 16, it is significant. And finally, if we have metabolic acidosis, high anion gap metabolic acidosis with osmolar gap, it's most likely toxic alcohol. So it's finally the presentation and the diagnosis depend on collection of a clinical feature and laboratory test. And there is no single test that I can say it's give me the diagnosis of methanol. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nahar. Uh, great uh, talk. We uh, will move now to Dr. Uh, Mohamed Adieb. He is a, an emergency medicine uh, consultant and a medical toxicologist at King Abdulaziz uh, Medical City in National Guard. Um, welcome, Dr. Mohamed. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bader. Shukran. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Nahar, for this uh, great presentation. Uh, first, do you, uh, do you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll move uh, to uh, the management section of uh, methanol toxicity. Um, so as uh, Dr. Nahar, uh, Dr. Nahar mentioned, basically um, uh, methanol is not toxic by itself. It's caused just uh, minimal inebriation. The toxic metabolite formic acid is the major toxicity uh, uh, that causes you know, optic uh, nerve damage, uh, CNS damage, and multi organ failure. And methanol is metabolized by alkyl dehydrogenase to form formic acid. Um, so basically, treatment of methanol toxicity is actually really- Muhammad, very... uh, share screen, Muhammad. Sorry, I'm not sharing the screen? No, you're not. Right. Okay, is that uh, good now? Perfect. 
Okay. Okay. So, um, so as uh, Dr. Nahar mentioned, um, you know, uh, methanol gets metabolized by alkyl dehydrogenase to form formic acid, which is the toxin that produces methanol toxicity from optic nerve damage to CNS damage to multi organ failure. And as I mentioned, uh, the treatment of methanol toxicity is actually fairly simple. Um, there's two facets of treatments. One is we have to block uh, the alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme with the antidote fomepazole, uh, or if we don't have fomepazole, we can use ethanol. This prevents the conversion of methanol to formic acid. The other facet is actually hemodialysis, where we have to remove the formed formic acid and also methanol from the human body. Remember that most patients with methanol toxicity will come to you late where they already formed significant amount of formic acid, thus causing symptoms and thus presenting to your emergency department or hospital. So um, the antidote for epizole or ethanol will not treat uh, formic acid. You have to clear it with hemodialysis. And then I'm gonna talk about adjunctive therapies. One is bicarbonate uh, therapy during resuscitation and a folic acid. So um, the mechanism of action of uh, fomipazole is basically, as mentioned, um, fomipazole competitively inhibits alkyl dehydrogenase. So it uh, also methanol will bind, wants to bind to alkyl dehydrogenase by competitively binding to ADH, you will prevent methanol to form formic acid. And uh, it's good to notice that fomipazole has an affinity 8,000 times greater than ethanol on the enzyme ADH. This is one of the many reasons why we favor fomipazole than uh, ethanol in treating toxic alcohol patients. So um, now to the really important actually uh, question is that what are the indications for uh, fomipazole treatment or ethanol treatment? Well, actually the, the indication is very simple. Once you make the diagnosis that this patient has methanol toxicity, you must give administer fomipazole or ethanol. And the problem is, how can you diagnose it? As Dr. Nahar said, the diagnosis is the dilemma. Why? Because we usually, we all probably work in hospitals where we don't have a methanol level available in a timely manner. Now, if you have a methanol level available in a timely manner at your hospital, then it's easy. Once you have a toxic level of methanol in your blood, you know, we defined here, we, do, we usually define it as more than 20 milligram per deciliter, which is a very conservative estimate, then you have a diagnosis of methanol toxicity and you must administer fomipazole. If, for example, you have a clear history of ingestion, someone comes to your uh, department with a suicidal intent and he said, I ingested windshield washer fluid, which has 10% you know, methanol, then you have a clear diagnosis. You should administer fomipazole. But the problem is most of the time, we don't have a methanol level available in a timely manner. It takes maybe 24 hours or even if you have it in the hospital, it probably takes five to six hours to come back. So you cannot rely on it. Uh, you cannot wait uh, for it before you administer treatment if you have a suspicion of a case. And you probably don't have a clear history of ingestion. So actually, in, in, in these cases, um, as Dr. Hard mentioned, it's a collection of three elements. Basically, it's your history, your osmol gap, and your anion gap. You have to use these three elements and with those three elements, you will then uh, derive, uh, you will then actually reach a conclusion whether or not you will administer fomipazole because you have a high suspicion of methanol toxicity or not. Of course, with the help of your clinical toxicologist on call if you have them available. So in history, for example, you have to ask basically, uh, you have to decide, do you have a strong clinical suspicion, moderate clinical suspicion, or no suspicion at all? And for, uh, for the osmol gap, as Dr. Nahar mentioned, it's not sensitive nor specific, but the rule is, you know, if they present early, they would have an elevated osmol gap. And the higher the gap, the more probably specific that this might be a toxic alcohol ingestion. But also a negative gap, as uh, Dr. Nahar said, does not rule it out because maybe your baseline osmol gap is already minus 10. So if you have a plus 15, it will be plus five, which does not uh, uh, basically rule it out. The other thing is you use your anion gap. And the rule is if you have you know, an unexplained severe metabolic acidosis, which is not explained by ketoacidosis, which is not explained by lactic acidosis, for example, 
in a young, healthy, uh, young male who, is not to have to, uh, who does not have any medical problems, then this should raise the suspicion of a toxic alcohol ingestion. So again, it's a collection of three elements. I, we cannot give you an exact uh, map of it, but you it's a case-by-case -case basis. And we have to reach a conclusion from history, osmol gap and iron gap, whether or not we think this all uh, three features point us to a direction to a methanol toxicity or not. Um, and if you look at the ACCT recommendation, they ba basically tell the same thing. You know, if you have a documented methanol, so basically these are the proposed indication uh, for using fomepazole or ethanol. And basically it's, you know, if you have a documented plasma methanol concentration, you, you would treat it. If you don't have it, then if you have a, a, re, a, a strong a clinical suspicion or history with an osmol gap or with an unexplained metabolic acidosis, then this will, uh, this raise the suspicion that this could be a methanol toxicity and you should probably uh, treat him with fempazole. And you should, uh, we should all know that we might treat him with uh, a dose of fempazole and then you know, methanol will come back after 12 hours later negative. It's okay, we might not uh, have the correct diagnosis all the time, but whenever we have a very strong clinical suspicion, we uh, should administer the first dose of fempazole to prevent the metabolism of, form, of methanol to formic acid. Um, so before I go to the other modality of treatment, you know, I'm sure that you all are convinced with fempazole as an antidote. You know, the evidence for it comes from 3D retrospective studies and one prospective studies. Um, you know, all of them, just to let you know, as in toxicology, they're all not, uh, uncontrolled studies, but they showed efficacy and safety. They showed efficacy clinically and with toxicokinetic data. They showed that uh, formic acid was uh, formed less when, the, when fempazole administered. And also back in the old days, uh, methanol toxic patients were almost all dialyzed, but with the introduction of fomepazole, a lot of those patients who did not have severe metabolic acidosis, had mild acidosis or no acidosis, did not need dialysis when they were treated with fomepazole, indicating that uh, you know, fomepazole does really work. So um, fomepazole versus ethanol, what would you use? So we should always use fomepazole. Um, it is superior to ethanol. And ethanol should only be used if we don't have fomepazole available. The reason is that ethanol um, basically, uh, you know, first of all, it needs ICU monitoring because uh, it can cause hypoglycemia, hypokalemia. You need to do these tests every two to four hours to make sure that uh, the patient's fine. They, it needs titration because you need to keep the ethanol level at a certain level, up to 20 millimoles per liter. And also has other side effects like uh, pancreatitis and respiratory depression. Uh, there is evidence for this. You know, there's a systematic review done uh, spanning uh, uh, studies from 1974-2014 showed that methanol toxic patients who were treated with fomepazole were, had less mortality than who were treated with ethanol, 17% with those who received fomepazole and 21.8% with those who received um, ethanol. Also, there is a um, in 2005, a retrospective charge review which showed that the adverse effects of ethanol, uh, ranging from coma, agitation to hypotension, respiratory depression, were more present and were 57% in ethanol treated patients than with fomepazole. So, all these uh, studies tell us that fomepazole has the same efficacy and it is safer and much well tolerated. So, it should be used instead of ethanol. Okay. So the second facet of treatment in uh, patients with methanol toxicity is hemodialysis. Now, as mentioned, um, if you form formic acid, if the patient forms formic acid uh, in their body, uh, they metabolize methanol, then the treatment to get rid of a toxic amount of formic acid is hemodialysis. Um, so it's for, the indications for hemodialysis then is fairly simple. Um, you know, as Dr. Nard mentioned, if we have formate level, we can actually use it to, to detect you know, a toxic level of formate, and then we decide who needs hemodialysis. Unfortunately, we don't have, most hospitals don't have formic acid levels, so we have to rely on the clinical features that formic acid does uh, affect, and then decide if the patient needs dialysis or not. So for example, if the patient has any organ damage, this means that they probably have toxic amounts of formic acid circulating in their plasma, so they need hemodialysis. So any new visual deficits, 
uh, this is an indication for hemodialysis. Any CNS uh, toxicity is like coma or seizures, which means that the patient is toxic from formates. Or severe metabolic acidosis. Why? Well, formic acid is an acid, so it will cause metabolic acidosis. And also, uh, formic acid is a mitochondrial toxin, so will, it will cause even further uh, acidemia. So if you have a severe metabolic acidosis, uh, the guidelines usually say less than 7.2 or less than 7.15 or a high iron gap, you know, more than 24. Then this tells you that this patient probably is having toxic levels of formic acid, so we need to dialyze the patient. And the third indication is acute renal failure. Why? Because formates and, or formic acid is excreted by the kidney as well as, as well as methanol. So if your kidneys are shut down, then you need to get them out by different means. That is hemodialysis. So these are like absolute con uh, indications. Uh, now, there is uh, a relative indication uh, most toxicologists uh, abide by is basically even if the patient presents early with no signs of uh, formic acid intoxication, so he does not have uh, visual changes, not, no severe metabolic acid, there's no sign of end organ injury, but he still have a high level of methanol, uh, more than 50 milligram per deciliter, a lot of toxicologists would recommend uh, dialyzing those patients. And the reason is uh, the methanol's half-life, if you give the patient frimpazole, will be very uh, long, from 50 to 70 hours. So you might end up with a patient for one week in your ward on fomepazole. Whereas if you dialyze them, uh, you would get them probably out within 24 hours. Okay, now with dialysis, what would you do? Would you, use, uh, would you recommend uh, to the nephrologist intermittent hemodialysis or continuous uh, renal replacement therapy? Now, as you all know, um, intensivists use CRRT a lot uh, in patients who are hypertensive. And the reason is most patients who get dialysis for medical reasons, they get it because of not only metabolic derangement, but they also have some fluid overload. So they usually need, need to get some fluid out of the patient. We say net fluid removal. So that's why in patients who are hypertensive, they usually wanna use CRRT instead of intermittent hemodialysis because you're moving fluids in a much slower rate so you will not affect the hemodynamic uh, of the patient. But what we need to understand in toxicological indications like methanol, the patients don't have fluid overload. You, we do not need to take a net fluid from the patient. So the best modality is still hem intermittent hemodialysis even if the patient's hypertensive. And this needs to be communicated with your nephrologist telling him, listen, we don't want to remove, remove any net fluid from them. We just want to you know, remove formic acid and methanol. So uh, the blood pressure will not be really uh, they will, a problem and they will probably tolerate it even if they have intermittent hemodialysis. And uh, intermittent hemodialysis is superior to CRRT. There is uh, a lot of evidence for this. Um, uh, so this is a study basically uh, that showed that uh, intermittent hemodialysis when used on patients with methanol, the half-life of methanol and formic acid was much, much less than when they used CRRT. Now, of course, you know, sometimes the nephrologists will say, still, the patient has severe hypertension, even intermittent hemodialysis, even if we're not going to move net fluids, just the movement of blood in the machine and back to the patient might affect hemodynamic. So yes, you can use CRRT, but most of the time, with you know mild to moderate you know hypertension, you can you, in those patients you probably can use intermittent hemodialysis, and it's much superior to CRRT. Okay, so um, these are the extrap guidelines for sp uh, specifically uh, to, for specific indications on when to dialyze patients with methanol toxicity. And as we mentioned, you know if you have end organ damage, which means that you have formate in your plasma circulating, causing uh, organ damage you need to dialyze the patient. So coma, seizures, new visual defects, deficits. If you have severe metabolic acidosis, a pH of 7.5 or an anion gap of 24, also is an indication for dialysis. And then we talked about if the relative indication, if you have a high methanol concentration, even without end organ damage or severe metabolic acidosis, you might wanna dialyze it to get rid of um, the methanol quite much faster.
And again, if you have impaired kidney function because these compounds formate and methanol are excreted by the kidney. Okay, so um, in terms of adjunctive treatments, um, so, you know, as mentioned, um, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't mention this, but of course you know this, that when you have a patient with severe uh, metabolic acidosis who you expect that you have methanol toxicity, the first thing you need to do is res resuscitate the patient. Fluids, correct uh, his electrolytes, intubate, you need to intubate him. But uh, after that, um, uh, before, so before uh, uh, initiating dialysis, um, bicarbonate therapy, correcting the acidemia by itself pending dialysis is really important in patients who are severely acidotic from methanol toxicity. Now, the reason for this is that when you have acidemia in your blood, you will uh, convert uh, formate to, for, to the more toxic formic acid, which actually will cross the blood brain barrier, go into your brain, go into your optic nerve, causes damage. If you actually uh, uh, return the pH to normal or even alkalize the plasma and serum, you will actually trap um, formic acid into the plasma, into the blood, prevent it from going into the uh, tissues. And, then, and hence, you will actually have a better clearance. You will execrate it by the kidney. Um, and we do have evidence for this. Uh, first of all, it makes uh, logical sense. It's the same concept as an aspirin toxicity, but also we do have, uh, uh, so this is just a, um, a representation. If you, so formic acid, if it's in the blood, and if you trap it in the blood by normalizing the pH, um, it will have, it, it will not go into the tissues and will clear, it gets cleared by the kidney. If you have acidemia, much, much more proportion of the formic acid will, form, form, uh, will actually cross the blood brain barrier and go into the tissues. So normalizing the pH is important to trap formic acid into the blood. Um, this is a case report that showed basically uh, this phenomena. So basically it's a 21 year old uh, male who uh, ingested methanol and because there were delay in treatment, delay in starting fomipazole and dialysis, they gave this patient bicarbonate and they had the chance to actually measure formate clearance before and after bicarbonate therapy. And they showed that after bicarbonate therapy and normalizing the pH, formate level decreased in the blood stream significantly without the patient getting sick, which means that probably formate was cleared uh, by the kidney. Another uh, study here is an animal study, actually in dogs. Uh, they were given methanol and then they uh, waited until uh, methanol uh, caused severe acidemia. When the pH of the plasma was 6.65, a significant proportion of formic acid uh, crossed the blood brain barrier and moved into the brain. When they alkalized the serum, much less formic acid was available into the brain. So this tells us that when you alkalize the serum or correct the pH, you will trap formic acid in the serum, preventing it from uh, going into the tissues. So for bicarbonate therapy, when you restate the patient, uh, you know, we recommend that you would also uh, c correct the acidemia of the patient. Um, recommended uh, the pH, you know, the recommendation of the pH is more than 7.2 or 7.3. Um, and of course, uh, bicarbonate therapy, sodium bicarbonate has disadvantages. You know, it can cause hypokalemia and hypocalcemia. So if there's no contraindication, the patient's potassium and calcium are normal, then um, bicarbonate therapy is recommended pending dialysis. All right, so uh, for dosages, I mean, you can look it up, but it's easy, but the thing is that it's a 15 milligram per kilogram bolus, and then every 12 hours after that. The thing to remember that during dialysis, because meprazole is dialyzed, we should um, dose it more frequently, Q4 hourly, for example. Um, ethanol also, you know, we can look up dosages, but uh, usually it's ACC per kilogram of 10% ethanol, and then a maintenance of one to two CC per kilogram per hour. You have to understand that uh, it had to be uh, titrated for an ethanol at 22 to 33 millimoles per liter. So we might have to increase the rate or decrease the rate depending uh, to keep the range tight at this. And also we have to monitor glucose and electrolytes. So they have to be in an ICU setting. Okay, so the last slide will be just the indoor endpoint of therapy. So basically when we start ADH blocking, 
uh, with Fomipazole, for example, we have to continue until we have a negative methanol level and the patient's clinically improving. Now, if we don't have a methanol level, we rely on the osmol gap and the, clinic, uh, and the clinical uh, status of the patient. But because uh, osmol gaps are not sensitive specific, um, we recommend that you repeat when you stop the treatment. For example, you know, you start a treatment with Remposol uh, for a patient uh, who presented early, you didn't need to do anything with dialysis. After 48 hours, the osmol gap is normalized, it's clinically improving. If you stop fomipazole and you cannot get a methanol level, you can stop the ADH blocking. But after that, you need to just you know, repeat anion gap every four hours for the next 12 hours to make sure there's no more drop in your bicarbonate or pH, which might indicate that there's still some methanol getting metabolized to formic acid. Uh, the same thing with hemodialysis. You know, we should continue dialysing the patient until we have a negative methanol level, which is defined here as less than 20 milligram per deciliter. Patients clinically improving. And additionally, we need to have a normal acid-based status because remember, when we dialyze those patients, we dialyze them to get rid of formic acid mainly. So even if methanol, even if methanol is normal, we need to make sure that his pH is normal as well and his bicarb and anion gap are normal before stopping dialysis. And if we don't have a uh, methanol level, we can substitute the methanol level with the osmol gap, but keeping in mind that because it's not sensitive or specific, after that, we need to just uh, repeat anion gap in the patient every two to four hours for the next 12 hours to make sure there's no drop in the bicarb or an increase in the anion gap. Okay, so um, in conclusion, basically the treatment is, you know, two facets of treatment, it's ADH blockade, so whenever you have a strong clinical suspicion of methanol toxicity, we should use it. Um, hemodialysis, whenever, is the, whenever we think there's you know, significant toxic amounts of formate in the blood, so any end organ effects or a very high methanol level uh, is an indication for hemodialysis. And remember, when, we, when you resuscitate, resuscitate those patients, um, uh, take, uh, be attentive to the pH, and I would correct the acidemia uh, pending dialysis because it does help in basically traffic formate into the blood and serum. Okay, so thank you so much. That's all I have, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, for now, we will uh, try to go over the uh, questions that we received through the Q and A uh, section. So the uh, first question is to Dr. Nahar Rueli. Um, the question is, I think you have, uh, you have gone over this, but we'll just uh, repeat it again. Um, the most sensitive and specific test for methanol toxicity. What is uh, yes. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Nahar. Sorry. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Uh, I think no single test, however, uh, for example, if we have uh, positive methanol test uh, more than 20 or positive formic test, uh, this is suggestive or diagnostic for methanol toxicity. But negative test doesn't rule out methanol toxicity. For example, a patient presented after complete metabolism of the parent compound, like methanol or formic acid, it may come negative. Uh, uh, smaller gap, metabolic acidosis, they are not specific or sensitive. However, we are trying to collect evidence, more evidence to say this is most likely methanol toxicity. Thank you, Dr. Naha. The second question I think is for Dr. Mohamed al and he talked about it at the end of his lecture, is what, what are the end points of treatment? Yeah, so, um, yeah, sure, we can repeat. I mean, so the end point of treatment uh, as a concept, basically, we need, uh, uh, so if, well, is it, for, for example, for ADH blockade, if you have a patient where you give Mepazole and he did not require hemodialysis, which means that you are basically assuming that he only has methanol, uh, but no formic acid or significant amounts of formic acid, you need to stop the treatment when you don't have any more methanol in your plasma. So if you have a level, it's great, but 
if you don't have a level, you should rely on surrogate markers. So what do we do is we rely on the osmol gap. Um, now the osmol gap is helpful if you do it in the same patient. For example, the patient had 50 and then you see it closing and becoming normal, then probably it has more meaning. So you can use that. Um, and then of course you need to make sure that clinically he doesn't have any major symptoms, his pH and is normal. And then you would stop. Um, and if you don't have a methanol level, um, I would recommend just, you know, you would repeat the pH every four hours for the next 12 hours to make sure there's no drop in the pH. Uh, you know, just because osmol gap maybe are not sensitive or specific. And with him with dialysis, same thing. You need to have basically a negative methanol level, but also you need to have a negative formate level. Since we don't have a formate level, you need to have a normal acid-base status, normal pH, normal bicarb, normal anion gap and the patient has clinical improvement. And then you can stop hemodialysis. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed. Um, the next question is for Dr. Nahar again, and I think he uh, went through this too. The neuro-ophthalmologic uh, findings of methanol toxicity. Just briefly, please, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, for the eye findings, it's ranging from uh, mild uh, decrease in the visual acuity or blurry vision or snowfield vision to complete blindness. So it's, it's uh, different from patient to another and even the prognosis is different when it's just mild or uh, uh, moderate there is hope or the outcome is much better when it's deep or significant blindness which which is usually become irreversible. For CNS finding, usually the patient drowsy initially and uh, there is risk for uh, seizure, for uh, butamin necrosis or basal, uh, basal uh, ganglia necrosis or bleeding. But it's rare, most of the time seizure, coma, this is the commonest finding. Thank you, Dr. Nahar. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Asad. Why do they add methanol to ethanol? Um, okay, so uh, to answer this question, um, basically it's either like accidental or intentional. So let's get the accidental first. So anytime uh, somebody is distilling um, anything to get um, spirits from it or alcohol from it, uh, usually what comes first is methanol and then it, ethanol comes after that. So people who distill uh, things to get to, to, uh, to make their own like drinks, they have to remove what comes first. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's either like they don't know how to do it or they just like in a hurry and they wanna make the, uh, the most like um, uh, amount of uh, drink to, to produce or to consume. So that's how they get methanol mixed with ethanol. Um, and the other, uh, the other thing is that um, um, the uh, intentional is that somebody will, will uh, like, like in the US when they do the, uh, the moonshine drink, uh, they intentionally uh, put methanol with the ethanol because it gives it, it, gives it a kick. Now, when we talk about methanol, ethanol, ethylene glycol, other like alcohol, um, the inebriation effect of the alcohol itself depends on its like molecular weight. So methanol by itself, it's not as inebriating as ethanol, uh, but it has a certain taste that's different than ethanol. It has this like different, um, I don't know, kick to it. Uh, so that's why they add it to, uh, uh, to, the, to the drink. The problem is, um, like, uh, uh, let's say you go and buy a, a cigarette, a pack of cigarettes. Um, it has the, the, the concentration of nicotine in it, okay? It will say like four milligram or like 10 or whatever. Uh, the problem with the homemade or illicit made uh, drinks is that you don't know how much methanol in it. So it, it can be just like 1%. And if, if you drink the, the bottle, nothing will happen because like uh, ethanol will just like, blah, like uh, uh, take over ADH and just like meth methanol will be excreted. Uh, but the problem is that you don't know. So uh, and, and, and 
um, and the person who is doing the methanol or, or like making the, the drink, uh, maybe he's like, he's not expert or something or, or and just mixing it or just like taking whatever it comes from distilling the, the uh, materials to get the, the drink. Um, and, that's, and that's how you get methanol with ethanol. And you don't know the concentration uh, in the drink. And that's why it is very risky to, to drink it. And you may just like get like 70% methanol or like 60% methanol or like nothing, 0% methanol. Um, so this is the, the issue with uh, illicitly made uh, drinks. Thank you, Dr. Asad. Um, the next question is, what are the contraindications to fumibazole? I think the, the uh, I'll answer this question just rapidly uh, because we have a lot of questions. So the contraindication is known hypersensitivity or allergy to fumibazole or birazoles. Um, otherwise, it's, it's very difficult to know if the patient has allergy to it uh, unless they have been exposed to it before. So it's very, very unlikely that you find a clear contraindications to given, uh, giving fumibazole. All right, so I'll move to the next question. So um, someone is asking about uh, how to remove formate without removing fluid. Um, uh, do we keep the patients on fluid while we're doing dialysis? I think this question is for Dr. Mohamed Uh Yeah, so um, <clears throat> what we mean is that basically when you uh, dialyze a patient, you, uh, the blood goes from, uh, simply, I'm not a nephrologist, but the blood goes from the patient to the machine. And when it goes to the machine, there will be a positive diffusion of substrates. And then, so it will clear, you know, formate, it will clear methanol, it will clear, you know, electrolytes, et cetera. And then we'll go back to the patient's, uh, uh, you know, patient, back to the patient. But uh, when we, most, most of the time when we dialyze, we dialyze and we remove net fluid. So, you know, that we remove fluid from the patient because they're fluid overloaded. Um, this removal of fluid, if it's done rapidly, can affect the blood pressure and the hemodynamic. But in toxicological indications, when we do intermittent hemodialysis, we do not want to remove any net fluid. We tell the nephrologist, no net fluid removal. It's just that the blood passes uh, from, the, from the patient to the machine, gets dialyzed, and then back, the same blood back to the patient. Um, so uh, I hope that answers your question. We, uh, so there's no net movement of fluid, no net removal of fluid. It's just, yeah, fluid is shifting to the machine back to the patient, but there's no net removal of fluid. Thank you. Excellent. So the uh, next question is, would uh, giving uh, folic acid or folinic acid uh, in late presentation be useful? Yeah, sorry, I forgot to talk about folinic acid. We should give it uh, to every patient with methanol toxicity um, because it enhances the metabolism of uh, formate into uh, carbon dioxide and water or folinic acid. And the dose is like 50 milligrams, you know, Q6 hourly. But uh, one month, no, I don't think so. I mean, one month, you basically will not have any methanol or formates in your body. If you have, um, so the question I guess is, you might have residual symptoms, like the patient is blind. Will folic acid help? I don't think so, but I'm not sure if there's any role of it. Maybe there is, but it will, the role for increased uh, uh, um, metabolism formate is not there. Maybe there's another role, who knows? But uh, so the answer is no, uh, because you don't have any more formic acid available after one month. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, the next question is, what's the best way or best method to give a sodium bicarb? So, um, so, I, so basically, it's sodium bicarb. Uh, I would give boluses, um, and then I would do the same thing, put three amps in, you know, in one, uh, one liter and run it at 150 and titrate it. That's what I would do um, to make sure that the pH until dialysis is above a certain level, 7.2 or 7.3. Uh, that's what I would do, yeah. Okay, so uh, the next question is, how long can we delay treatment if we are not sure about the diagnosis? So uh, to me or, so uh -huh. yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, this is, uh, the, 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 as Dr. Nair said, the dilemma is in diagnosis. So there's no right or wrong answer. You know, it's a case by case basis. All I have to say, if you have a strong clinical suspicion, we should initiate treatment. 
So the question is how, uh, I, I hear the question is, how long can I wait? The sooner the better. Uh, the, the more we wait and the patient is sick, the more there is metabolism of methanol to formic acid. Um, but, you know, for example, uh, what, you know, I don't know about the, uh, my other colleagues, but what uh, I would do is, you know, let's say you have a sick patient who has severe metabolic acidosis, you know, if we can immediately rule out that he does not have ketoacidosis or lactic acidosis, lactate, so we will order osmogap, anion gap, lactate, etc. His lactate is not very high. He's, he does not, does not have any medical problems. He's young. If you don't have any other explanation, an unexplained high and again metabolic acidosis, I think you should immediately start treatment. There's no, I don't think there's a time that I will say I will wait, like maybe three hours or six hours, because it's a continuous process. The sooner the better. I'm not sure about if uh, the other, uh, our, uh, the other panelists have any other uh, opinion. I agree with your answer. I don't know what the others. <laughs> um. Can I comment? Yes, Dr. Nahar, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, one thing I didn't mention, I don't want to confuse the group about uh, late presentation. There is a chronic presentation after methanol toxicity. There is an association between Parkinson's and methanol toxicity. There are people diagnosed after, for example, 10 years or eight years with Parkinson and when they linked what happened, they found a group of them. It was initially at the beginning of the symptoms associated with methanol uh, toxicity. And in this situation, of course, we will not treat with antidotes, but we involve a neurologist and uh, to, diagnose, to treat as Parkinson's. Uh, as some of them, they are exposed to inhalation of methanol rather than drinking uh, of methanol. For acute presentation, I agree with uh, Dr. Muhammad. If I think still there is element of uh, uh, acuity of the disease like acidosis, like uh, uh, osmolar gap, like progressive disease uh, within, let me say, I don't have specific time, but I will say within four or five days, I will treat. I will give uh, the benefit of doubt for the patient. Thank you, Dr. Nahar. There are uh, two more questions for you. Why there is a predilection of uh, uh, for forming to uh, optic nerve and butamine uh, nucleus? Why, why, why formate like specific areas in the brain? Maybe to any one of the panelists, I don't know. Uh, for me, I, don't, I, I, I didn't find anything uh, explaining what's, what's the reason. Uh, and I am not sure if any of my colleagues have read anything about it. Um, I do not know why, to be honest. But um, um, I don't know why it has a predilection to the optic nerve. Um, now, but we know that my, uh, formic acid is a mitochondrial toxin, and um, you know, I, you know, the CNS needs, I guess, energy uh, at a higher rate. So anything, any mitochondrial toxin uh, like cyanide, formic acid, CO, will affect the CNS, you know, very rapidly, because it's very sensitive to any, um, you know, you know, energy changes if you block the mitochondria, for example, uh, from uh, cyanide or CO formic. You're the CNS will be affected immediately. But yeah, why the optic nerve exactly? Why CNS not like the heart or something? I'm not sure why. All right. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Nahar probably. Um, is there a difference in pediatric presentation uh, with methanol toxicity? Dr. Nahar? Uh, yeah, the, the only difference uh, is the, the toxic dose. You, you know, ethyl, toxic alcohol, ethylene glycol or methanol, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, a small amount may cause significant toxicity, only 5 ml or less of methanol or ethylene glycol will result in high level that require uh, 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 dialysis. Uh, otherwise, the presentation is similar to, the, to adult, it's metabolic acidosis and uh, uh, 
it's not common as we see in adults, it's rare. Most of the time it's accidental. Most of the time they are doing well, but you know, the amount is uh, a small amount might be significant. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what's the duration between ingestion of methanol and the, the uh, development of irreversible vision loss? I don't know if we, uh, we have a cutoff for the duration, but uh, uh, does uh, any of you want to answer this question, guys? According to the study that we have, uh, there is no relation uh, between the uh, visual loss and the presentation. Uh, it seemed that even uh, the treatment, if, it's, uh, uh, if there is significant blindness at the time of the presentation, it seemed that the treatment may not change anything. However, I, I still think it's, uh, it's uh, stop at least the progression. If it's mild or moderate, then definitely I would say quickly we will start to treat to, to, to stop progression. But once the, the damage happened, uh, I, I, I think it's irreversible. Yeah, I agree. And that's why we need to identify it early and treat as soon as possible to prevent any further damage. Thank you, Dr. Nahab. Um, the next question is, uh, it's not a question, it's, it's just, can we unify the treatment protocol in Ministry of Health and non-Ministry of Health hospitals? I think we should all work on that and try to get some clear guidelines on what to do when we have cases. Um, the next question is, what is the dose of ethanol and fomibazole in CRRT? Uh, yeah, so basically um, uh, you would use um, this, and fomibazole I would use, in hemodialysis uh, I would use 15 milligram per kilogram uh, every four hours in CRRT. To be honest, I need to look it up. I'm not sure how, like, would they use it every four hours or because it's slower, I would just use it every 12 hours or 10 hours. I'm not sure. We, uh, we usually don't recommend CRRT, right? Unless Sorry? We, do, we usually don't recommend We CRT. don't, unless the nephrologist really, really is so yeah, yeah, any, uh, against it because the patient is like really, really, really hypotensive. But usually, yeah, even if they're moderate hypotensive, uh, intermittent glasses preferred, but um, I'm not sure. I mean, the, but the idea is that we need to understand that things will get dialyzed. So I would give one at the beginning of the dialysis, and if I'm going to continue to give one at the end, every four hours in intermittent dialysis is good. But in CRRT, I'm not sure uh, if there is a clear guideline, and if there is, I do not know. I need to look it up if I had the situation. Right, so the, uh, uh, the next question is a, about smaller hospitals. Uh, if, we, uh, we're, they're, if they're not sure about the diagnosis and they're not, they, do not, they do not have the appropriate lab test, what should they do? I think I can answer this question. Uh, now the Ministry of Health over, uh, offers um, a, a consultation 24 seven by a medical toxicologist. They can even help you with guidelines. So if you call 1937, they will give you the, uh, they will let you talk to the medical toxicologist, especially for sick patients, and they will uh, give you guidelines and will help you with treatment and will do the follow up with you. Uh, so just give them a call and they will help you. And sometimes they can even um, let you know where the antidote is available in, in, in some uh, cases. All right. So an early presentation of headache and drowsy is, oh, sorry, is early presentation of headache and drowsy is an indication of hemodialysis or an antidote is enough at that time. So if the patient just has headache and drowsiness. Um, uh, Dr. Nahar maybe or Dr. Mohammed? Um, so, I mean, uh, yeah. so it is a clinical, uh, you know, uh, case by case basis. I guess headache and drowsy. Drowsy is what do you mean by drowsy? Mild drowsiness. He's oriented to place, time, person. No, I would not dialyze him. And even I would, even the antidote. I mean, if there's no clear history, I would, you know, uh, like wait and see, do the onion gap, osmo gap. Um, but if there's a strong clinical suspicion, of course, I would give the antidote. But um, headache and drowsiness by itself, uh, no. I mean. 
Well, if, the, if it's severe, decreased central nervous system, approaching like, you know, coma states, and I know it's a methanol toxicity, yes. But uh, just headache and drowsiness, I don't think so. Yeah, I guess it's, it's not just these, uh, you're not going to look at these features only. If you have high suspicion, even if the patient doesn't have a lot of symptoms, we're not going to wait until they develop symptoms. We're going to give them the, uh, the ADH blockers, and we, uh, if they have acidosis, we'll dialyze them. But most of the patient, as Dr. Mohammed said, they will present late. So uh, you will have more finding than just headache and drowsiness. Um, maybe uh, they have headache and drowsiness for other reason. But if you have high suspicion, then just treat. Well, the question is because I mentioned, you know, whenever you have end organ damage, it means you have formate you need to dialyze. So the question is headache and drowsiness end organ damage. So no, it's not, if it's just mild drowsiness headache, it doesn't mean that, you know, it's probably from formate. Uh, that's the question, I guess. Oh, perfect, um, thanks. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a clinical decision, but uh, just drowsiness and headache, probably not. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, uh, I think we should uh, we should remember that uh, uh, fombizol is expensive drug, and uh, I have limited number of uh, or uh, supply in any anywhere. So if I don't need, if I want to give it, I need to select the patient will will benefit uh, from using this medicine. And otherwise, I will save it for someone who need it. For dialysis, again, it's not hemodialysis. It's not simple procedure. It's in phase of procedure. Uh, I want to make sure that really it's indicated. So it's not just if there is headache or just mild symptoms and I will push the patient for antidote or dialysis. No, I need to, to uh, wait at the benefit and harm and uh, collect the evidence about uh, how, 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 to what extent I suspect the diagnosis. Perfect, thank you. Um, so uh, the next question is, what's the difference between methanol and ethanol toxicity? And uh, does using uh, alcohol swabs or uh, uh, hand sanitizer uh, causes toxicity? So, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, Asad, maybe this time. So I, I just, uh, so, so methanol uh, is what we are, we're talking about. Ethanol toxicity is basically just like drinking too much alcohol. Uh, so it's uh, like, it's acute versus chronic. It's, it's another issue. Uh, mm -hmm. It's another topic. So, uh, but in general, it's just like nausea, vomiting, and just like coma, and, um, and it's not a big deal. It's not toxic itself as methanol. Uh, as for like hand sanitizer and uh, uh, other like disinfectant we use, it depends. Is it like alcohol? Is it methanol? Uh, most of the time, or is it isopropyl alcohol? Most of the time, uh, you it's either methanol, or either ethanol, or um, isopropyl alcohol. Uh, and with the new COVID uh, like pandemic, the new guideline from the WHO, um, most of the hand sanitizers and disinfectant are actually ethanol. Um, methanol, um, as I did not mention it, but uh, Dr. Adib mentioned it, um, uh, it's, in, it's used in industry. It's not used in anything uh, related to human. Uh, the the main place you would see methanol is windshield wiper fluid. Um, other than that, it's just like like pure industry, like in in, in um, uh, factories and uh, other like specialized places. Uh, not no like yeah, regular human being will not be in the uh, will not be there or not will get in, uh, will not get in contact with it. Um, so yeah, it's just uh, uh, hand sanitizer is ethanol uh, or isopropyl alcohol. There is no toxicity from using it. Perfect, thank you. So, uh, what's the role of thiamine and uh, vitamin B12, and how soon should we should should they be started? Um, for, uh, so, uh, so basically, thiamine. Yeah, I mean. Patients who abuse methanol probably are ethanol abusers. You can't start thiamine um, uh, on them. Um, and vitamin B12, 
is is it pyrodox is it pyrodoxine? I forgot. Yeah, I, I'm not sure it has a role in, in uh, specifically in methanol toxicity. No, it doesn't. But uh, yeah, pyridoxine is, you know, usually used to ethanol glycol, but I forgot if B12 is pyridoxine or something else. I think it's... Uh, pyridoxine is B6, so... B6, it's, yeah, so B12 is uh, what? It's cyan cyanocobalamin, right? Yes. So, yeah. so no. Uh, but, oh. you know, thiamine, we can use it because they, are, uh, they abuse ethanol. Um, Pyridoxine is, we use ethylene glycol. With methanol, we use uh, folic or folinic acid. Thank you. Um, so how to clearly decide uh, which to start, fomibazole or hemodialysis? Oh, okay. So, well, first of all, <laughs> whenever you start hemodialysis, it means you, would, you need to give also ADH blockade, okay? So um, you need to start fomibazole. So maybe I, uh, I didn't mention this, but whenever you decide that you wanna do hemodialysis, which means that you have toxic levels of formate in your blood, you probably even also sometimes have methanol still going to be metabolized to formate. So you would need to give, the guidelines said you would still need to give uh, ADH blockade. Um, so, uh, and to clearly decide, uh, so I don't know if that answered the question, but the, the indications for formipazole is basically whenever you think there's a diagnosis of methanol toxicity and to get, get this diagnosis, you know, it's difficult. So it's a clinical suspicion where you use your history, your osmol gap, your anion gap, your labs to decide if this presentation probably is uh, methanol toxicity. And hemodialysis is that when you think they present late, they have four mates already and they, they, there's end organ damage, then you need to dialyze them. And whenever you decide to dialyze, you would also need to use uh, an ADH blockade as well, bl blocker as well. Uh, at least this is what the guidelines say. Um, now you might have a situation where probably you have zero methanol and uh, you don't need to start, uh, do ADH blockade. But for, uh, for now, I would, whenever I decide to do hemodialysis, I will actually uh, give formipazole. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Um, there's a comment here by Dr. Tarek, and I echo him uh, on that comment that homemade alcohol is dangerous, is dangerous as it makes uh, methanol a, a toxic uh, time bomb. It will delay and prolong the methanol effect. And, um, uh, and uh, so if we have seen a patient presenting actually four days later with, uh, with toxicity, and they say they, they, they didn't have any drink in the last two or three days, and if they, they probably have a mix of uh, ethanol and uh, methanol. So it takes time for the ethanol to get metabolized to get to a, to a level that's below the ADH blockade and then methanol started to be metabolized and caused the toxicity. So thank you for that comment. Um, the next question is, something is happening with the uh, question and answers, something is moving. Okay, so is there any benefit of ADH inhibitors hemodialysis for late presenters, like after two to three days uh, of ocular symptoms? Um, uh, maybe? Uh, is there any benefits um, after two, three? Well, okay, so, okay, so if someone, uh, as Dr. Nahar said, you know, if you ingest methanol with ethanol, you can have delayed presentation up to 24 to 48, sometimes even up to 96 hours before you metabolize your uh, toxic alcohol to uh, formic acid. So yes, of course, you know, in fact, most cases that you will see is that they will come two to three days or one day after ingesting uh, ethanol or methanol in a, like in a party. They will not present to you the same day. At least, you know, if it's pure methanol, six hours. If it's with ethanol, at least a day. So of course, if they will present two or three days. Usually that's the presentation, actually. After two or three days, they will present to you with uh, uh, symptoms of uh, formic acid toxicity. So yes, you would start and do an AHD and hemodialysis. Thank you. Um, the next question is, are there any other compounds that can produce formic acid other than methanol? Uh, the one I know is formaldehyde. Formaldehyde, yes. formaldehyde but, yes. uh, yeah. Which is just you're ingesting something in the middle. You're not ingesting methanol. <laughs> you're ingesting the methanol metabolite. 
Um, all right, so uh, when, uh, when will I measure the level post ingestion? So uh, I think the question is, yeah, I think the question is when, um, what time, is there a time when uh, a level can be done and a time that it's, it's not that useful? I think that's what they mean. Uh huh. Uh, can I comment? Yes. Yeah. Uh, just, just a small comment. Is it just like, um, uh, so it depends. So let's say I, uh, I consumed alcohol. Uh, it depends on the stomach. Is it fully, uh, do I have a full stomach or my stomach is empty? Um, and uh, the bioavailability of the, of the drug or like the alcohol. Uh, so most of the time within 30 to one hours, if, if, it's, a st if it's an empty stomach, all the alcohol is in the blood. I don't know about you guys, uh, it's, uh, if you agree with me or not. Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree. I mean, if you, uh, methanol will be absorbed uh, quickly, fairly from the stomach. Yes. So, uh, like, if someone ingests methanol right now, and if you, I think if you do the level in one hour, you would find a positive level, an elevated level, or maybe two hours or three hours. But uh, uh, usually, they will, you know, when they present, it will be a couple of hours after presentation. So, if you have a level time available, I would do it immediately. Um, that's my, yeah. So I agree with you, Asad. Okay, so. And uh, when, uh, when the methanol outside the body, it's so complicated the process, uh, it go uh, zero order kinetics, then uh, switch to first order kinetics. So it's complicated. And if the, if the person ingested alcohol or not, so the metabolism is not, especially in toxicology and any overdose, it's not usually fixed uh, uh, number or time. It's depend, differ from person to person, but I think uh, maybe up to 24 hours, but there is no specific number, no, no certain time for this. Perfect. So what's the role of CT scan in the workup of methanol toxicity? I will say it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the decision depend on the presentation, any indication. Uh, for example, someone with altered mental status or uh, seizure or uh, focal neurological signs or uh, anything suggestive of a brain insult, uh, I, I guess it's indication of, uh, of CT brain. But we need to stabilize the patient before this because finding in the CT, it wouldn't change a lot about your care. So make sure that you stabilize uh, your patient, regard the ABC and uh, correction of acidosis, et cetera. Thank you. Um, the next question is, should hemodialysis be considered for patients with methanol toxicity who present with mild visual abnormalities? Enemy. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, so basically, if uh, you know, there are cases in the literature where someone has uh, mild, very mild visual changes with many, very mild metabolic acidosis, and with fluoropazole, they got, it got reversed. I think reflecting that there is little formic acid, and when you blocked further formation, the formate was cleared. But um, again, really, it's a case-by-case -case clinical thing. If they have the snowy uh, appearance or like, uh, you know, um, moderate uh, visual impairment, uh, my threshold is low because I don't want to have any irreversible damage. This, uh, it depends what we mean by mild. So there is, we need an objective measure, halhumathan, you know, uh, scotomas, when uh, counting fingers, well, et cetera. Um, so I guess the answer is, you know, it's case by case, but my I think the threshold, I would have a lower threshold to make sure there's no irreversible damage. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if there's anyone have a different answer. So, 
So uh, uh, the next is a comment that um, all, uh, all the B vitamins are useful in case of methanol toxicity. Um, I think we, what we're saying is the specific one is the, the uh, for, for, uh, for, um, for methanol is folate to enhance the elimination of, uh, of uh, formic acid. But uh, we typically give this patient, patient vitamins because they're chronic users and again, um, uh, they might have vitamin deficiency. Um, so we're not saying it's not useful, but we're talking about the specific stuff. Uh, um, bit, yes. Can I, can I just, uh, one comment is that um, in, in any case of toxic alcohol, what we usually see in Saudi Arabia is different than what we, uh, other places in, in, in the world, like the, the, like the, the number of cases of methanol versus number of cases of other toxic alcohols. Uh, but in general, any any time, if you give any vitamin B, it's okay. It's not there is no contraindication from giving vitamin B, uh, folate and uh, or like folic acid versus folinic acid. No, um, no different uh, difference between the two uh, in the treatment. So it's it, uh, actually if if, uh, if you are saying, oh, should I give fomipazole? you should give folinic acid and vitamin Bs uh, or folic acid and vitamin Bs uh, while searching for fomipazole because it buys you time, even if it was minutes, um, uh, it, it buys you time. So um, there is no contraindication of giving, of giving any vitamin B or folic acid or folinic acid to any patient. So just whatever you have, give the patient. Yes. Um. But uh, these, these are cofactors. The most important is you don't delay dialysis and you don't delay the ADH blockade for these. So these are addition. Um, and I think uh, my colleagues would, ag would agree on that. Um, uh, if a patient with alcohol consumption and drug overdose came to a small hospital, how can we eliminate the methanol toxicity? Again, I think this, this question has been um, answered before. So it's a small hospital that they have limited resources. So how can they exclude methanol toxicity? So uh, I we guess- answer, We answered we, this question, yeah. Sure. Yeah, we've repeated many times uh, how to scream for that. I, I don't think we should go again and again. Uh, someone is asking for if there's persistent symptoms after two days. I'm not sure what they mean. Um, I, I'm not sure about uh, the question. So what's the question again? I, I, I'm not sure what they mean. Uh, in case of persistent symptoms after two days. Maybe they're meaning so, failure of treatment or uh, no response. Is that a possibility? Yeah, so you would, the, the, the rule is you go with the treatment until they Okay, so if, uh, you would ideally you go for treatment until they are clinically improved and they reverse their symptoms and their metabolic panel is reversed. Now, if you go on for two days and you reverse everything, but they're not waking up, probably they're brain dead, then it's a different story. But um, the rule is you should go with treatment, ADH blockade or hemodialysis for as long as they uh, have clinical improvements, normal methanol level and uh, normal you know, formic level or an acid base, which is normal. That's the simple rule. Um, and yes, it, uh, actually it is, uh, it, it is reversible. Visual impairment is mostly reversible when you start uh, ADH blockade and hemodialysis. S some of it will not be reversible, but a good proportion will be reversible. You know, coma will be reversible, and they will they will have reversible uh, uh, clinical uh, states. So yeah, the rule is you go in until reversibility. But yeah, if you go in for a long time and you know the metabolic panel is improved, methanol is improved, but they're still clinically really deteriorated, maybe then we should they should have a different test like a brain te uh, um, you know uh, a brain dead test or uh, I forgot the, uh, you know brainstem reflexes, et cetera, et cetera, to decide if they are actually brain dead or not. I don't know if that answered the question. Thank you so much. Um, I think there are no more questions. And if you guys do not have any comments, 
Um, I would like to thank everyone for attending the uh, webinar and we hope it was useful. Um, thanks to Dr. Yasser Alaska for arranging uh, all the technical stuff. Um, and thanks to uh, the, uh, uh, the Ministry of Health and 1937 and thanks, special thanks to the Saudi Commission for Health Specialities for uh, accommodating us uh, in this webinar. Thank you everyone, uh, be safe. Uh, thank you for the speakers. Uh, have a great night. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.